I have two devastating disappointments for you. The first is, I have a presentation for which I deeply apologize. Um, I shall explain how this came about. They gave me exactly 19 minutes and 18.3 seconds to talk or something, um, which is enough to say one sentence. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to tell you so much that you will not be able to keep it stable in your head if I don't have a mnemonic up there. We'll see how it works, because I don't remember how to do this. So I have, I have, I have gone belly up to a Bill Gates-mediated late 20th century death trap, the presentation. My apologies. The second devastating uh, disappointment is that I stand at a lectern. This is because someone had the bright idea to put a series of tables on my catwalk. <laughs> and so I'm anchored to this thing here. Now, being the son of a, a preacher woman, it evokes a pulpit, and so it's, it's all in the family, I suppose. But um, if you do have the illusion that I actually have notes, you are still sadly mistaken, because I don't have any. Um, but um, so let's talk about micro experiments. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that my lab is doing, the lab we founded about three, three and a half years ago at uh, Griffith Uni up, uh, up in Brisbane, um, and what some of the partners that we are working with are also doing. And I will explain why micro-experiments, first of all, is a really bad word. <laughs> yeah, We've got to find a, a better one that's more politically palatable for your organizations. Um, but, uh, but also why they are desperately necessary as we, back, going back to Cody, have to move away from unsubstantiated beliefs or faith-based safety, right, um, to science-based safety. Um, and as we heard last night, Eric Wigglesworth was all about that to begin with. So I think in that proud tradition, we should continue, hence the micro experiments. I'm going to talk to you uh, about some of the micro experiments, uh, many of which uh, are, are ongoing. And uh, so I, I can't mediate many results yet. So they may, they may all turn out to be complete disasters, um, which, uh, which would be cool in its own right, by the way. But because they're... they're <laughs> We'll see about this too, but they're supposedly uh, safe to fail. Um, let's uh, first talk about safety differently. What is it that we want to experiment with safety? When we started formulating the ideas about safety differently some three, three and a half years ago, we had groups together, uh, Dave was part of that, and, and Kelvin and many others uh, in, uh, in, in, in serious positions in industry in this country, um, and in fact some foreigners, uh, I'm a foreigner too, um, we converged on a, on, a, on a couple of ideas that really locked down what, what, what safety differently might mean uh, to, uh, to thinking differently. Um, people are not the problem to control. Many of the safety initiatives, of course, that we do have today uh, presume or at least allude to the idea that people are the problem to control. You do this control by more procedures, more punitive measures, more safety vests, more high-vis gear, more PPE, uh, and telling everybody else to try a little harder. Um, and so people are a problem to control. No, says safety differently, people are not a problem to control. They are a resource. They are an incredibly rich resource of problem solving in ways that you don't even know about because they do it so incredibly smoothly that it is largely invisible to the casual observer or the distant manager, and certainly to the WAHS puke filling out Excel sheets in some distant office. Um, the second point of, uh, of, of safety differently is don't intervene in behavior, all right? Um, if some of you are still believing the Dupontian idea of intervening in behavior, go back to Cody and go back to Dupont itself, which managed to kill five people last year, as you know, including two brothers, right? So there's a family has to go to two funerals to bury two sons inside of a week. Thank you. Thank you, behavior-based safety. All right? If you still have beliefs associated with that, start looking at the data, people. Start looking at the data. We are, just as a reminder, in the 21st century. The scientific revolution has been going on for a little while, all right? I may be in a pulpit, <laughs> but there's something to think about. Um, 
the third point of safety differently is that we really should, should shift or at least complement the measurement of safety as an absence of negatives, which seems to be the most popular way and the easiest way and the most fraudulent way and the most useless way to measure safety and complement that with measuring safety as a presence of positive capacities rather than an absence of negative events. Um, of course, we all know that that which gets measured gets manipulated, right? And we in humanity have no limit to our creativity in manipulating safety figures as long as they're organized around an idea of an absence of negatives making you look good. Um, and finally, uh, as I advocate quite strongly in this and many other books that I write apparently quicker than Dave can read them, um, <laughs> I don't read them either, actually, so it's, it saves me some time, I suppose, but um, <laughs> because the, the, the book you've just written is never as interesting as the book you're currently writing, which is also not as interesting as the book you're already planning in the back of your head, which is not as interesting as spending time with your kids. Um, but safety not, as an ethic, sorry, safety, not as a bureaucratic accountability to people up the ladder, but safety rather as an ethical obligation or an ethical responsibility for people who work for you, who do your dangerous and dirty work. Of course, we, in fact, as a community, have been part of seeing this transformation over the past, I would say, 30 years of, of changing safety into a bureaucratic accountability. It's all about making your numbers look good. As David Capers quips, and I've said this before, beautiful, but just as a, it's a, it's a, little, it's a little icon out there that you should remember. It's not about LTIs, MTIs, triffers. It's about the LGI, says Dave Capers. And I go, what's LGI? And Dave says, ah, the looking good index. All right. And so we are obsessed with the LGI. Our boards, our managers are typically obsessed with the LGI. All right, so, so much for safety differently. There's also a book by the title, by the way, but that's, again, that's a few books back, or one book back. Let's talk about micro-experiments. All right, so experiments is not new. Experiments is, in fact, exactly that, which I think has both driven and supported, um, if not reified, the Enlightenment in the West. We have gone from mere faith and belief and largely ignorance to understanding knowledge and control by experimenting. A beautiful painting shows this quite nicely. Uh, it's done by Joseph Wright in the mid-1700s. Um, and it shows an experimenter. In fact, he's doing an experiment driven by the work of, of Boyle, which is oh, about 90 years before this was painted. Um, and he's got a bird. Now, this is a very unfortunate experiment because there's a death involved. It actually creates a fatality. But that was sort of the point of the experiment. So I'm sorry, I apologize for the, uh, for the, for the inverse example. But um, what's interesting about the painting, 1760, about there, all right? Joseph Wright paints this. Look at the experimenter. He's looking at you. He's saying, let me, let me draw you in. Let me, let me make you part of this. Now, there's ethical concern, you see the little girl go, oh, the bird, the poor bird, because what's about to happen is that he's going to pump that little chamber in empty of air. He's going to vacuum the bird. That tends to finish the bird, which it will. Um, but it's this sort of experiment that actually taught people, taught us to know what's in the air we breathe. We had no idea, absolutely no idea, right? These kinds of experiments is what we need to engage in to move from faith-based safety to science-based safety. So let's talk about micro-experiments. I, I just came up with this definition. We can call it many different things. A controlled change of conditions to explore and demonstrate a discovery. But would you, how do you explore a discovery? I mean, that's nonsense. So it's actually a really shitty definition. So come up with something better. Um, we need to probably come up with a better yeah, definition. Um, why is it important, though? First of all, it's the huge momentum of the status quo that we need to talk about that I think can only be undermined if we come up with evidence, with experiments that demonstrate a different way of doing things rather than just professing it as an ethical belief, which is nice, but not enough. Um, indeed, the need for empirical evidence and the issue of safe to fail. Let's talk about those three. So momentum of the status quo. This is very non-trivial. Um, I think many of you might have seen the Deloitte report from last year. Um, get out of your own way. That's the title of the report. It's about the uh, rise of compliance in Australia. Um, apropos uh, Peter Gaines' 
talk about lack of productivity, I find it deeply ironic to have to tell you about the following figures. 20 years ago, about 5% of your economy was driven, held up, created by compliance workers. Today, that's 9.6%, or almost 10% of the Australian economy is driven by compliance work. You know what the price tag for that is? It's $250 billion a year, right? $250 billion. Let me put that in context. Your trade with China last year was $136 billion, right? It's pretty much half. All of your work with China is half of what you spend on compliance in this country. A third of that is, is insurance and corporate risk. Uh, a third of that is pretty much uh, compliance with, with ways to manage financial risk. But a full third of that $250 billion is us. It's OHS. All right. We are responsible for that. Every working man and woman in this country spends eight weeks out of the working year to cover the cost of compliance. And only then do they get to work. How is that for completely eroding a productivity base? Now, I find this ironic because we measure safety in productivity numbers, LTIs, MTIs. Those are not safety measures. They're productivity measures, right? Very capitalist, uh, productive numbers. So we measure those. We get obsessed by them in order to not lose productivity. And what do we do? We have an incredible bureaucratic apparatus and all the encrustations and conferences and books surrounding it that actually hurts productivity much more than if we would just let it go. That's, that's a thought experiment. But $250 billion, I think it's a safe bet. $250 billion, 10% of the economy consists of compliance workers. Now, you could argue, oh my word, that's an incredible failure. It's a failure of governance on an epic scale. Or is it? Perhaps, perhaps we've been incredibly successful to corner a tenth of a Western country's de democratic economy is a huge accomplishment, right? It's an incredible achievement. 10% compliance workers. Wow. Now, if you want to push that over, that's going to take a bit of energy. <laughs> because there's a few stakes involved, right? Like a safety institute that wants more members, right? I mean, this is one example, right? Like lots of consultancies, like lots of organizations that are encrusted around this whole enterprise of compliance. Apropos the sponsor of the day, right? Just look at the back of your pack. Um, so, which Jeffrey and I thought was deeply ironic in many ways. But um, the <laughs> thank you for sponsoring me. I don't know what, but thank you for the water. Um, so the momentum of the status quo is enormous. You're not going to push 10% of an economy over by shouting more loudly from a pulpit and say, accept something else in your life as the truth. Right? That's cute, but it won't work. You need some evidence. Right? And so that's what micro experiments are about. Hence the need for empirical evidence. Safe to fail. Why is safe to fail so critical? Because if you, well, if anything, because you need to get ethical clearance if you're at a publicly funded university and you do any of this. That's why it's important to have a safe to fail uh, way of doing these experiments. Um, but of course, this is not about the science. It's about 174 lives. It's about people. It's about giving a damn. It's about our own ethical responsibility. All right. So every time you do these experiments, you need to think about, are they safe to fail? That is, if they don't work, will I not make things worse? All right. Now, given the injury figures in some areas, it's really difficult to make things worse, by the way, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right, my last slide. This is it, but we've got to talk through all of these, so there you go. I have seven for you. There's more, but I have seven for you. Um, so this is the lab's work. In many cases, in some cases, it's actually work done by partners that we uh, work with in industry in this country. Um, the first one is really simple. So some of these are, are quite uh, elaborate and take a lot of work uh, and a lot of lobbying. Uh, some are really simple, and you could do it this afternoon uh, or tomorrow or uh, on Friday when you're back at, at your job. 
Um, so create a numbers parking lot, measure safety differently, kill a procedure, study normal work or investigate success, take everything out, try a restorative just culture, and ask what is the absolute most stupid, idiotic thing that we are asking you to do to work here. Um, and so there is a bunch of those experiments that we will run through quickly. Create a numbers parking lot. Why is this important? We have looked at many ways, many different ways, to try to reduce this obsession with reducing the number of negatives, all right, the number of negative events. Um, to the point, of course, that Cory was into this already, and I, 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 I've written a lot about this, but this, this obsession, of course, with zero, which is, a, which is a typically Western affliction, right, because we seem to have this ontology where we can actually believe, and it's good to believe in a world without suffering. Right? And we have a whole Christian Judean tradition around that, right? A world without suffering is possible and it's achievable and it's worth striving for. Other traditions don't bother with that idea. They just say, well, let's show compassion with each other, right? Let's think about Buddhism or some other tradition. So a zero vision makes absolutely no sense. If you believe safety science, a zero vision makes absolutely no sense either because there is no single theory of how accidents and incidents come about that will give you the confidence that a world without incident and accident is at all possible, all right? And so there's no science underneath that ethical commitment at all. But it's a nice commitment. But that obsession leads to really fraudulent practices, all of which we, we know very well, all right? But the, the latest one I learned yesterday, really cute. Um, <laughs> I was in a, a particular operation, in fact, in Melbourne, um, and a guy had to go to the hospital uh, to, uh, for a follow-up. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, he's got to wait for five hours to see someone. He's a public hospital, hard-pressed. Um, and I go, so, so I mean, what does that do to the numbers? Oh, no, no, we've got that solved. Uh, his hospital visit, that's, that's suitable duties. Right. Okay, those of, those of you who don't laugh think that that is entirely normal. Okay. I'm just saying, right? I mean, we have become incredibly creative in making the numbers look good. Hence, creating numbers parking lot. What does that mean? Many cases, you can't not have these numbers. You can't contract to governments, state governments in this country if you don't show those numbers. But show them in a judicious way at the back of your tender report. At the front, show all the good stuff you're doing. Show the positive initiatives. Show the capacities you and your organization, your teams, your leaders have to create safety. Advertise that. And then say, as a, almost a footnote, oh, by the way, oh, oh, you want these things? Yeah, yeah, nobody believes in them, but okay, here they are, right? We did supply them. All right, so push them away. All right, very simple, not innovative at all, really, um, but something that not many people are doing. You open an annual report, here is my LTI, our TRIFER is really good. Yeah, and then you killed five people last year, right? Uh, DuPont. Um, measure safety differently. Uh, Kelvin Genn, wonderful experiment. Um, he, has, uh, he has proposed a net promoter score for thinking about how to measure safety. Talk to Kelvin about that. Wonderful little experiment. It's severely underdeveloped and, cre and, and in fact needs more work, but it's, it's a nice little idea. Kill a procedure. I was working with a petrochemical company uh, and they had a procedure for how to clean up a dead pigeon. <laughs> I, I wish I was making this up. I'm not making this up. Um, to me and to my 12-year-old daughter, that would, be, that would be getting a shovel, right? Um, but no, 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 there has to be a procedure. Um, so go back to your operation and, and, and just make it your job for the day. You probably can do it within half an hour to kill a procedure. Currently working with a, a particular airline in a country that, anyway, they have a, a cabin operating manual with all kinds of safety procedures. It, it is 883 pages. All right? Now, none of the crew members I ever talked to show on their iPad the current version of the thing because they've all stopped downloading it, right? Because it's so completely irrelevant relative to their work. Uh, 883 pages. They've now set themselves the goal to reduce that to 250 pages, um, <laughs> which is no, nobody's going to read that either, but it's, it's, it's nice, it, perhaps a feel-good optical of, oh, it's only two. Yeah. In an iPad, you actually don't see how thick it is, which is discouraging, but, um, except the thickness of the iPad. But... Um, Study normal work, investigate success. Um, you will hear, what, what, stop. <laughs> Who's the professor? <laughs> so, the, um, the one, of my, one of my former students, uh, Dan Humerdahl, is going to talk tomorrow. And so he, he's, he's launched a project within his, his employer called Alpha. Beautiful uh, uh, 
initiative, but, well, initiative project. Here's the idea. What we have seen, and when you look at your own operation, and you've had one of the 174 fatalities, in many, are you going to take something else? Are you taking over his role now? <laughs> I thought you were on my side. Good God. Um, I'm almost done. I have, never mind. Um, here's the idea. When you look at the fatalities, very often, these are not people violating the rules, doing dumb things, human errors. These are normal people getting the job done. They're doing normal work. And what's the scariest thing when you look at the, at these, at the, at the etiology of these fatalities is that these are people who are creating success. They're being successful at what they're doing. They're not failing at what they're doing. They're hugely successful in what they're doing for you, for the company. And so the idea is that we need to get much better in investigating and understanding how people create success. Of course, Eric Holnagel, who talked last year, would, would back that, that up and say, you have vastly more success than you have failures. You're stupid to throw all your investigative resources at looking at these failures, because you're not going to learn much of value. Look at how people create success, because, of this, these are my words, death and fatalities, they hide in your successes. They don't hide in your failures. Death hides in success. All right? It hides in how people are getting your job done. All right? So there's a lot of science behind that book, everything. Um, next experiment which is one of the coolest, which is, went live last week. And this is not just a, oh, let's do this. No, 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 it's actually a randomized control trial run by uh, a couple of my students. Um, take everything out. Now, this seems to be, I think, the prescription for areas with persistent injury numbers that are just not budging under any other known remedy. And the known remedies are particularly those that are locked up in industrial battles, where you have your WHS Nazis coming in and influencing in their capillary power the smallest movements and choreography of people who do work. No, no, no. You can only move your leg this far, and then you should stand like this and move in between and lift like this and keep it close to your body. Right? And so, which is really cute and might be helpful, and you may have a consultancy run on that, on that very idea. And good on you. Um, <laughs> Or, yeah, not so much good on you, but um, keep doing it. Um, but, but what we are doing is often sending people in there who are half the age of the guys who have been doing that work for the last 38 years, and they're speaking to their fathers to well, they wear their seat belts or, you know, what, or safety is as important as ABC. Always be careful, right? When I read, I, you know, the bucket I to puke in isn't large. You know, it's not large. I feel not proud to be part of this profession. Um, so the, the prescription here, all right, because very often these are locked into cycles of stability where people come in, the OHNS people come in and, and affect with coercive power what people are doing in these sites. And what do you get in return? You get pushback. You get defiance. You get resistance. You get peer pressure to not comply. I've been in many operations where that is palpable. If you do comply, the delicate will have a little conversation with you out of view of the camera, right? And so if, if we want to keep, get out of that, the way to do that is to take everything out. Rip the posters from the wall. Take the lifting devices out. Tell the WHS Nazis to go on a project to Alice Springs for the next six months or so and not show up. Tell the manager to not do walk-arounds. Take everything out. This is, in fact, what we're doing with one organization in a randomized control trial over the next 12 months to see what happens. The site manager gets one rule in return. We take everything related to safety except that which is mandated by law, act, or regulation, like fire exits. Otherwise, everything goes. And the site manager gets one rule in return. Don't hurt anyone. That's it. Over to you. This feeds into the idea of autonomy, mastery, purpose, self-determination, the key ingredients to motivation in the last 15 years of science on motivation. No sticks and carrots, no autonomy, self-determination. Right. Try restorative culture. Um, the, uh, Stuart Dunn has already suggested the three things we need to ask. 
um, of people. So rather than having a just culture that says, who did it? Who screwed this up? How bad is this screw up? What should the punishment be? Which is a typical, you have flow charts to find these things out. I've written a book of this too. It's a really bad idea, right? Because most often we don't govern that well at all. Ask these other three questions instead. Think about what Stuart said, all right? What was the first thing he said we should do? Ask for an explanation, all right? And then ask for an apology. We then ask for reassurance. Have that conversation, rather than trying to find the spot in the chart whether you can fire the guy or not, all right? Ask very different questions. Who is hurt? What are their needs? Whose obligation is it to meet those needs? All right? And finally, what is the most stupid thing we ask you to do to work here? Try that at home. Do try that at home and in your own organization. I'll give you two examples that I will shut up. Um, it's actually, I'm perfectly on time. Almost. Um, two examples. One is an organization very much in the Roger Roger 10 4 that makes, during the induction, people watch a video that is six minutes long of how to carry a coffee cup. <laughs> it's, it's, and this is in your country. This is in your country. I mean, if, if, it, is, it, is, I mean you can, it is infantilizing in the extreme, right? People are the problem. You are a kid. You don't understand anything. Let me show you how to carry the cup, right? It's unbelievable. But what's really unbelievable is that we spend resources on this. What's even more unbelievable, but anthropologically really fascinating, is that we attach a belief to it. Like Corey, this is your Roger Roger 10 4. This is your way of keeping the evil spirits at bay, right? Rather than putting a cross at the door, you actually make them watch a video. But psychologically and anthropologically, it's exactly the same behavior, right? And you go, <laughs> as Bruno Latour said, we never have been modern. We never have been modern. There's actually a book by that title, but it's French translated to English, so it's profoundly unreadable. Um, so, unless you read French. But, um, but it's, it's really good. The, and the other example, I, uh, I, I, and then I'll finish, is even more beautiful and perhaps even more simple to, to, to eradicate. So this is a site, WA, there's a site. Uh, there's, a, there's a distance that you have to go from the bus to the camp, right? Um, and that distance, apparently by some fascist intervention of some, some uh, enlightened OHNS soul, was declared uh, an area where you have to wear high vis. And so here's these guys, right? They've been they've busting their chops for 12 hours. Oh man, I really need my four beers, you know, my four light beers that I'm statutorily entitled to have uh, before uh, the camp closes for the night. <sighs> There's irony in that too. But um, the <laughs> the rule then is, of course, these guys are in high vis shirts, right? But that's not good enough. No, 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 you have to wear high vis. So as they exit the bus and have to transverse like 450 meters to the camp, they are actually handed out yellow vests to put over their high vis shirts to comply with OHS fascism. Now, if that is not the most stupid thing you have to do to work there, <laughs> but ask that question, you'll be surprised at what you find. Don't call them micro-experiments, because even Dave Proven might not find that a good word in his, his organization, but something like projects, right? And in many cases, this won't generate the kind of initiative fatigue because you might be taking things out rather than putting things in, which is a great and celebrated thing to do. Thank you very much.